Well, good evening and welcome to our fourth and final installment in Thessalonians, last thing. So tonight we're going to take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapters uh, 2 and 3, and then the concept of anti-trinity and uh, the Antichrist will be featured in this uh, study in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, but we need to see the other members of the anti-trinity, the devil, and the spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, when we've studied 1 John, um, you see this quote-unquote anti-trinity uh, in 1 John. When you study Revelation, uh, you see this anti-trinity in, in uh, Revelation in symbolic form. So uh, what we'll see is uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6 talks about this. Paul says you got to understand it's not people that are the problem. There are demonic forces at work. So what we're going to see is God, one God, three persons, and Satan seems to be mimicking him with his, his use of a demonic spirit, spirit of the Antichrist, and a man playing the role of God. And so this anti-trinity is something we want to explore in 2 Thessalonians. If you recall, uh, here's two letters that may be the earliest of the books of the New Testament. Paul's writing to Christians in Thessalonica, and it's very, it's very positive as far as their, their conduct, their faith and their perseverance, their love for people. So when you read it, it's not a harsh letter like when you read Galatians, where they were going off track in the legalism. But as you read it, there's issues that they have regarding the end. And so both of these letters deal with eschatology, a study of the last things. And that's why we entitled this Thessalonians, Last Things. And so in this section, he's going to talk not about resurrection like we saw in 1 Thessalonians, but he's going to talk about Christ's second coming, what precipitates that, and this rise of Antichrist. Evidently, there were some people in Thessalonica who were confused, who had heard that Jesus had already come, and so they were not going to go to heaven. And so they were kind of thrown into an uproar, and so this <coughs> clarification in Paul's letter was meant to calm them down, and again, encourage them to stay faithful in the midst of the persecution that went on. So with that, let's pray, and then we'll take a look at 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Lord, I thank you for this time and the chance to open your word. Lord, I pray that you would give us insight today, that you would help us to know you better, and then to make you known. Lord, I thank you that we have victory because of what you've done. You've lived perfectly and taken away our sin, and we don't have to be afraid of anything. Lord, I pray that we would have that boldness and understand what we're up against not people, but it's demonic spirits, it's forces in the heavenly realms. Lord, you've already won the victory. I pray that we live in that victory, live as more than conquerors, and continue to make you known. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and now Paul's going to address this question that these people had regarding uh, the end. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord had already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So on your outline there, the first bulleted point, He's trying to clarify this concept of the Lord's return. Again, there's some confusion about Jesus' return, kind of panic setting in, so he's trying to straighten that out. He says, now concerning this, verse 2, don't become easily unsettled or alarmed. Um, in the Greek, don't be shaken, uh, don't be frightened, okay? You don't need to panic, because he was there teaching them, and so he's now trying to reassure them this is... Nothing what you heard is what I was conveying to you. It's wrong information. Um, I gave you 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. If you just want to flip back to the end of 1 Thessalonians. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul had talked about now when Christ returns, he brings with them, or brings with him the souls of those who have died, and those believers are resurrected. And if you're alive on the last day, you're going to be caught up to be with the Lord, and your body will be changed instantly. You won't have to go through death. And then he said in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, he goes uh, in verse 4, You brothers are not in darkness, so this should surprise you like a thief. And then in 20 and 21, he said, 
test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. And so the whole concept of someone talking about, for example, in this scenario, the Lord's return, you, you check it with scripture. We've got to know God's word and be able to test things with the inspired and inspired word of God. If you remember back in Acts, the Thessalonians were exposed to the gospel and they believed, and then Paul went on to Berea, and it said this in Acts, now the Bereans were a more noble character, and they checked every day to see if what Paul said was true. And so they were checking with the scriptures, is Paul really saying what the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament scriptures say? And so that's an example of testing everything as you turn back to 2 Thessalonians 2. So don't be unsettled, you should know this, but again, compared to what you know in the scriptures or what I taught you, but because uh, there's this false information that's out there. He says in verse 3, um, the Lord will not return until two things happen. Verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, the Lord's return will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. On the outline, the rebellion, what's that? In Greek, it's, it's apostasy. It's a falling away from the faith. There will be a great loss of faith in Jesus as Savior. Uh, hold a finger here in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, and let's go to Matthew 24. So Jesus talked about this. One of the marks that you're in the end times is there's a, there's a tremendous falling away from the faith. It'll happen due to persecution. It'll happen to, due to deception. And so as you turn back to Matthew 24, we're, we're picking up in verse 9. The disciples wanted to know about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, and then they wanted to know about signs of Jesus' return. So that's what Matthew 24 is. You can read Mark 13, you can read Luke 21, they're the same conversation, the same discourse, the same speech, if you will. And Jesus says this in Matthew 24, 9, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Notice it's not your biological sex, it's not your socioeconomic level, it's not your nationality, it's because you are a Christian. Verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So this whole idea of falling away, Jesus talks about that. I think one of the most shocking verses is this one. Now let's go to Luke 18 and verse 8. Let's go to Luke 18, 8. So again, you're still holding a, a place at 2 Thessalonians 2, and now we're going to Luke 18, 8. Jesus tells a parable about being persistent in prayer. He says, what you ought to do is keep seeking, keep knocking. You've heard that, right, in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus tells this parable of the persistent widow, this widow who needs justice, and so she keeps knocking on this judge's door and keeps asking at him in opportune times for justice. And so finally the judge says, fine, 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 I'll, I'll take care of it, right? And so Jesus uses that to talk about how we should keep praying and not give up. And so you're in uh, Luke 18, let's start at verse 6. Luke 18, verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So again, keep seeking, keep praying. Eventually, again, God is going to bring justice. Especially, obviously, on Judgment Day. Now look at the end of verse 8. However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? And to me, that's a frightening verse. Well, of course, there's going to be. And then you read Second Thessalonians, there will be an apostasy, there will be a falling away from the faith. And so I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. And so this whole thing of holding on to your faith, there are some Christians who say, once saved, always saved. You, you can't lose your faith. You, 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 it's, it's secure. And so if, if that's the case, the book of Hebrews doesn't make any sense. What Paul writes about in First and Second Timothy doesn't make any sense. 
Or again, what Jesus is talking about, there will be people who fall away from the faith. If you, if you couldn't lose your faith, why, why is Jesus, why are other people talking about this? And so an apostasy will occur, all right? Let's go back to the uh, Second Thessalonians passage in chapter 2. And now he mentions the man of lawlessness, or man of sin. We're going to use the term antichrist here. He says in 3, And then the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. This is the first of three times that Paul says the Antichrist will be revealed. And so three times he's going to say he's going to be revealed, he's going to be revealed. And so because you're in God's word and because you have your eyes open and you're listening to what Jesus said in Mark 13, he said, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. But what do we watch for? Well, this, where Paul is just going to lay out marks of the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist will be revealed, and Christians will understand who he is. If you've never read the scriptures, or you don't believe this, again, there will be great deception that goes on. And so it's, it's clear uh, what this is, this is all about. Um, when I was teaching, there would be questions about Antichrist that kids would have. When I was teaching down in Texas, when I was teaching here in Milwaukee, there'd be questions about Antichrist. And so, uh, Ronald Andrew Reagan. Ronald Andrew Reagan. There's six letters in each of his names. 666. Six, six. Is Ronald Reagan the Antichrist? All right, so, so that question came up. All right, and then when Barack Obama was elected, is Barack Obama the Antichrist? And so we had to take people back to scriptures like this. Once we have a chapel on Antichrist and, and, and just walked through historical uh, uh, figures that people labeled as the Antichrist. So if we go back to the Revolutionary War, King George was labeled as the Antichrist. Right? Adolf Hitler, World War II, was labeled as the Antichrist. So we can go back in time and you can see people saying, I think this is the Antichrist. So on one level, they got to applaud them because they're looking. But when they don't fit all these marks, you go, well, I wouldn't bet money on that, right? I wouldn't, wouldn't take those Las Vegas odds, right? So what you're going to see now in verses 5 through 7, just to jump ahead, there's something restraining um, the spirit of the Antichrist, and that is the Holy Spirit. Interpreters struggle with this section because Paul talks about this uh, power at work, and then something holding it back, and then he uses he. So he uses this uh, uh, kind of an it kind of mentality, and then a he explanation, and that's why interpreters go, we're not quite sure what Paul's talking about here. Is he talking about the Christian church? Is he talking about the Holy Spirit? And so, just to jump ahead a little bit, um, verse 5 through 7, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? So again, you've become unsettled, you've been frightened, you've been shaken by something. I didn't, I never taught you that. Don't, don't you remember this stuff? Verse 6, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time, Antichrist. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. That section's tough. So when you read commentators, Christian theologians who are chewing on the Greek and trying to break all this down, they're going, what are you talking about, Paul? Is this the Christian church that's going to be taken out of the way? Is the Holy Spirit no longer converting people? The last Christian has been converted? And so on, on the outline there, I, I just put down, I believe it's the idea of the Holy Spirit is resisting the spirit of the Antichrist. You have the upper hand. Go out and preach the gospel now. The Holy Spirit's at work. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world, Jesus says. And so again, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about the Anti-Trinity. And so in the big chunk now, chapter 2, Paul will break down the Antichrist. When you read Revelation, you get to chapter 13, you've got two monsters, a beast that comes out of the sea and a beast that comes out of the earth. Right? The beast that comes out of the earth is this um, Antichrist. And so it's, it's all picture language. But what's fascinating is when you read this, literal breakdown of the Antichrist, and then look at Revelation 13 and the beast from the earth, um, it, it, there's, you, you can see uh, the parallel, you can see the imagery uh, lining up. So let, let's go back to verse 4. So the man of lawlessness will be revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Verse 4, he will oppose 
and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time, second time. Revealed as the used. Verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, third time, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So if you take a look at the outline there, second bullet point information about the Antichrist, what does Paul break down for us? Again, it's not the symbolism of revelation that can trip us up, confuse us. He just breaks it down for us very clearly. So this is a man of lawlessness, a man doomed to destruction. So it's a human male. It's not another demonic spirit. It's not Satan himself. Uh, and so, again, the cross-references we'll look at later in, in 1 John and Revelation when we're looking at Andy Trinity uh, after the break. And he's a man of sin or lawlessness. Sin is missing the mark. And so if you have the goalpost, I think we've used this analogy before, if you have the goalpost, and you miss left or right or short or misses a miss. What is sin? Sin is missing the mark. Harmatia in, in Greek. And so if you're missing the mark, this is what God's will is. Everything within the goalpost, this is what I want you to do. But if you don't, you're missing the mark. These can be sins of omission or commission. Sins of, of things where you violate God's will or you forget to do what God wants you to do. Either way, they're outside. So he's a man of lawlessness. Verse 4 says, he claims to be God, and over every religion, over everything. It's fascinating, the, the, the temptation of Satan in the Garden of Eden. If you eat off this tree, you'll be like God. And so here's one who, again, seems to say, yeah, I am God, right? And then uh, a, a, uh, a verse that can be taken two different ways because of, of what the temple holds uh, in Scripture. So, he's going to set himself up in God's temple, verse 4, proclaiming himself to be God. So, if this is 52 AD, the Jerusalem temple is still in existence. In 70 AD, the Romans will destroy it. Titus Vespasian, the, the general, will go in and destroy it. Because the Jews have rebelled and, and, and the Romans have had it. And so they go in and they um, lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. It is horrific. Josephus records how terrible this is. And eventually they go in and destroy the temple. And so Jesus prophesied that this would happen and it would be a sign. And if, he said, if you're alive in this time, run and get out. And, and uh, Eusebius, a Christian historian, says at this time the Christians fled to a town called Pella. Because they saw the army surrounding Jerusalem. Jesus talks about this in Luke 24. So they, they saw the Roman soldiers coming around and, and now setting up camps outside the city. So they, they realized some 40 years later, this is what Jesus told us about. So they got out. Eventually the Romans go into the city and they destroy the temple. So if Paul says he's going to set himself up in the Jerusalem temple, well, 18 years after this letter, the temple's no more. So on the outline there, literally, the temple would have to be rebuilt for that prophecy to come true. If you're interested, you can look up what people have as far as plans to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. It is absolutely fascinating. There are people who want a temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is pretty much a city that's split up between Jews and Muslims and, and Christians and, and other people there. The idea of erecting the temple back where it was would be this political uh, grenade thrown into the Middle East. But some people speculate in the future, there's going to be some kind of peace deal brokered and a temple's going to be rebuilt. What is known is this. There are 
Jewish people who are trying to have the temple rebuilt, from what I've read, they have reconstructed some of the implements for the temple following what you read about in, in the first five books as far as this is what the, uh, this altar of showbread should look like and this is what the candlestick should look like, priestly garments, looking for a young man who would be willing to serve as priest. And so what's fascinating is to listen to people who do want to re, uh, reconstruct and then reenact temple worship in, in the whole nine yards. If that happens, that would be something to watch for. When Israel was born again as a nation in the late 40s, a lot of people who understand biblical prophecy were very shocked by that because they realized, wow, now it's a nation again. What will come next? Will eventually the temple be rebuilt? So again, if you're interested, you can look that up and you can see people's plans for that. If it's not setting himself up in the physical temple, on the outline there, under number four, he could be saying he's setting himself up in the temple of the church, in the Christian church. And so, um, sometimes in scripture, our body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit, First Corinthians. But this idea in Ephesians 2, where Christ is the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets are the foundation, and then we are living stones in this church or temple. And so, is the Christian church going to see the Antichrist come from one of its members, all right? So that's what people would say, if the temple's not literal, then it's symbolic, all right? Uh, number five there, he's doing miracles by Satan's power. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24. He said there will be people who do signs and wonders to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. And so Jesus talks about people being able to do signs and wonders and, and fool people. Here, it's clear it's by Satan's power. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And so, uh, I love that expression, these are counterfeit. So if I pass a counterfeit bill, it's not issued by the treasury, it's issued by bread, all right? It's not from the source. And so God is doing this, all right? And so it's not God, it's something else. The way I look at this, these counterfeit miracles is the contrast of Jesus and his miracles. When you read the Gospels, watch the miracles that Jesus does as he performs them. John points out these showed who he was. It was a display, this, this wonder was a display of who he was. He's no, no, no mere man, he, he's God man. But he'd always tell people, shh. So he's not trying to draw attention to himself, right? He'd do these miracles and then he would want it quiet because he's not, he wants people to follow him for the message of salvation, not that he can do tricks. So, for example, when he feeds the 5,000, this miracle you find in all four Gospels, in John, they want to come and make him king by force. You are going to now be our leader, and you're going to give us everything we want, right? And, and he's not doing it. And so again, why are you following him? Do you follow him because you love him, because you understand who he is and how he's going to save you? Or is it because he's going to help you, he's going to give you what you want, right? And so, this is just my opinion, right? Just so, just for clear, this is my opinion. I believe Antichrist will show the miracles and then do this and say, look at what I can do because I'm God, right? As opposed to what Jesus was, don't tell anybody, he'll do just the opposite. When you read it in Revelation, I gave you the cross-reference, we're not going to go there now, 13, 13, Revelation 13, 13. It says he, he breaks down fire from the sky in direct view of people. So it's a, it's a throwback to Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where fire comes down to prove who the true God is. So that's why I wonder, will this Antichrist really do miracles to prove who he is, just the opposite of how Jesus approached his miracles. But notice uh, in 10, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, um, he is a deceiver. You can see that in Revelation. Uh, and this deception goes on where, again, he's getting people off track from worshiping the true God. But he is destroyed in the end by Christ's second coming. So in uh, 3, he is the man doomed to destruction. And in 8, it says, 
uh, that Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. When I taught in Texas, there was a student who had seen the movie The Omen. And then he wanted to know where the seven knives were that are going to be used to kill the Antichrist. He said, I'm going to go find those knives, all right? And I told him, oh, look, I appreciate your zeal, <laughs> but don't go stab at anybody, right? We've we got some laws against that, besides what Exodus talks about. Um, but this idea comes from this movie that Antichrist has got the 666 birthmark, and the only way to destroy him is to plunge these seven knives into his heart. And so that's Hollywood, and it's the movie The Omen, if you've ever seen it. Um, if, if you want to know what happens, did they get rid of him? There was Omen 2 and 3, so <laughs> I'll let you figure that out yourself. But um, uh, this idea that humans are going to dispose of this guy, no, Jesus comes back and it's just over because he's God man and, and, and not this man pretending to be God. So there's a, a hard section in the rest of 10 going to 12 that talks about people who are lost, who are damned. Uh, middle verse 10. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. The parable of the sower, I believe, is, a, is an incredible parable. God's word, the seed, goes out everywhere. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Why aren't they? All right? in, in the first uh, path, or in the first area of seed, it's a path, it's a hard path, and the bird comes and takes it away, and Jesus goes, the devil takes that message away. All right? And so God wants all people to be saved, but all are not going to be. Well, why not? It's not that he chose some to be damned. That's what some denominations teach. Double predestination. He chooses some to be saved and some to be damned. No. Doctrine of election is pure gospel. It's pure grace. God chooses us. We don't choose him. But then why isn't everyone saved? Well, satanic deception. And here, like you see Jesus run into, people who just refuse to believe. You read this in, in John 5. Jesus says, these scriptures testify about me, but you refuse to come to me. And so, when you read John 5, Jesus goes, what do you want? The Father has testified about me at his baptism. John the Baptist testified about me, who I am. The miracles I'm doing are testifying about me. The scriptures are testifying. So he's, he's going, what more do you want? You refuse to come to me. So it's a stubborn reaction on, on, on their part. And so there's satanic deception, but there's also personal rejection. And so as you take a look at that third bulleted point, unbelievers have rejected the truth. It can be a willful reaction. Um, uh, in John 3, Jesus talks about people loving their sin. They, they want to stay in the darkness. Sometimes we're prideful. I don't want to admit I'm wrong. But again, there could be satanic deception as well. Second Corinthians talks about uh, the spirit of the sages blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't uh, see the truth. But what's troubling, what's, what's frightening, is God giving them over to the lies, all right? For this reason, 11, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they'll believe the lie. Rejection has happened. So one of the most frightening things you can find in Scripture is this. God saying, thy will be done. Not my will be done, your will be done. So be it. This is what you want, there you go. And so I gave you cross-references here. In Exodus 7 through 11, you can read about the ten plagues. Sometimes, if we're not familiar with Scripture, we go, well, God was not fair to Pharaoh. God was not fair to Pharaoh. He didn't have a chance. God hardened his heart. And when you read those plagues clearly, the first five plagues, it says, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh, of his own stubborn will, said no. The plagues happen, and the Egyptian magicians replicate the first two. And you can understand why Pharaoh goes, I'm not letting you go. My slave labor? Your God is no better than my God's? Because we can do the same thing. So you can understand why he goes, I'm not doing that. The third one, he can't, that the, the Egyptian magicians cannot replicate it. They say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. We're, you got to understand, there's something at work here, and we can't do this. You better understand what you're up against. Pharaoh hardens his heart, 
and then goes on with the fourth and the fifth, he's hardening his own heart. Then in the sixth through the tenth plague, it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I gave you five strikes. I was more than merciful. And now I will use you. So, and, and God told this to Moses, that all the world will know that this story will come out, that I brought you out of Egypt with my mighty arm. And so in Exodus 7 through 11, there's this stubborn rejection, and then God gives them, gives him over to his rejection. 1 Kings 22, I told you that story before, of Micaiah, the prophet, the godly prophet, who explains to Jehoshaphat and Ahab what is going on. Ahab wants to attack Ramoth Gilead. He doesn't know if they're going to be successful. So he asks his prophets, they're false prophets, are we going to win? And everybody goes, yeah, you're going to win. You're going to gore those people. And Jehoshaphat, the, the, the king of Judah, who's a godly king, goes, don't you have any prophets here? I mean, real prophets? And, and uh, Ahab goes, well, there's, there's one guy, my king, he's always saying negative things about me. And so, Jehoshaphat said, you just do me a favor and bring him in. So he comes in, and he says, yeah, you're going to win. Knock yourself out. And Ahab says, tell me the truth. And he goes, well, you want to know the truth? Here's what I, I saw. I saw a scene in heaven. God was on his throne. And God said, who's going to deceive Ahab into going, into going to his death? And he said, these spirits came forward, and one said this, one said that. And, and one said, I could be a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. And God said, go do it. So Micaiah goes, God has allowed these demonic spirits to lie through these false prophets. You're not going to win, you're going to lose. And Ahab will have none of it. Jehoshaphat doesn't heed what he's saying. And it ends up exactly what Micaiah says uh, is going to happen, occurs. Ahab is wiped out in battle, and they were not going to be victorious because, again, God gave them over to their lies and rejection. Finally, Romans 1, 18 through 32. Hold a finger here. Let's go to Romans 1. The danger of us in America is God giving us over to what we want. Thy will be done. You want to follow me? Your, your will be done. And so... I'm glad we're doing biblical citizenship study coming up. I encourage you to go to that. But what's troubling is to understand when it happens in Egypt and it happens in Israel, this idea of God seeing people, leaders, in charge, going off track, and then God going, in your stubbornness, you're not listening, your will be done. And I will give you over to your lives. And I will give you over to this, all right? In Romans 1, 18 through 32, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew, neither knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Now watch this. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever blessed or forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Therefore, or furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. 
They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Three times in that section, Paul goes, do you understand God gives people over? That is a form of judgment. I'm done here. Your will be done. And so as you watch the culture go in a direction that's against God and His will, God goes, your will be done. And so you need, I need to, we all need to continue to speak the truth in love. And that's why what, what struck me as I read First and Second Thessalonians on my own and thought, boy, let's talk about this. Paul talks about judgment. He says, you've got to understand, in the, in the first letter he keeps talking about it, in every chapter, Christ is coming back and judgment is going to occur. And when people lose the fear of God, and do whatever they want, it is not a good thing. And I've read things this week that are just shocking to me. What's going on in schools, what's going on in hospitals. And so as you understand God giving people over to their sinful desires, it never ends up good. It's always this depravity. Depravity by definition, unable to tell right from wrong. Unable to tell right from wrong. Let's go to... Uh, back to Second Thessalonians. I was talking to my teaching the faith kids about that last week. Talking about depravity. And I said, Isaiah 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Proverbs 30, verse 20, The adulteress wipes her mouth after eating and says, I have done nothing wrong. To understand that there comes a time when people take what is evil and call it good and then take what is good and call it evil or are so depraved they cannot tell right from wrong. And so that proverb, the adulteress, wipes her mouth after eating and says, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. My sexual relations with that husband, that, that husband of another woman, that's not wrong. It's just like eating. It's, it's what? And so when you're depraved, you cannot tell anymore. You have no moral compass. You, you cannot tell. And so to understand... Um, this, this judgment that happens before the judgment day, that's a frightening thing. That's a frightening thing. But here's Paul's encouragement. We pick up in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved to the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's on the outline. Notice again, it's all God's work. It's always been God's work. God, you made everything, then we rebelled. What did you do? You made a way of salvation. You did it. You brought us to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the sanctifying, by the setting apart work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So again, he creates faith in us. We are dead in our transgressions and sins. Ephesians 2, God makes us alive. He deserves the glory. We rejoice when baptism happens, right? You are born again. You are born from above. It's a supernatural act. And that's what Nicodemus goes, I don't get it. He goes, yeah, I know. It's like the wind. Right? Like you, see the, you see the leaves blowing, right? He goes, that's like the Spirit. It, it, you know he's at work. You just don't know how that works. Just like you can't see the wind, but you saw the effects of it, right? So the, the blessings to them uh, for God choosing them, the first fruits on the outline there, Gave you the cross reference. We've talked about this before. The first fruits festival was a spring festival. Just as the first things are sprouting from the ground, people would take that and give that back to the Lord, saying, "Thank you, Lord. We know there's more to come." And so the resurrection is this image of first fruits. More people are going to be resurrected, like Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, I love fourteen. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. I give the outline uh, cross references to Matthew 17. It's the Transfiguration. It's I always use this analogy. It's Clark Kent taking off 
the shirt and it's showing the Superman S on his chest, right? God-man is showing Peter, James, and John that he's not just man, he's God-man. So he shines, his clothes become brilliant white. God the Father says, this is my son whom I love, all right? And so they're seeing the glory of the Lord. In John, uh, in, at the beginning of his gospel, in the, in the prologue, he says, we beheld his glory, all right? And then in uh, 2 Peter, Peter talks about this, all right? That transfiguration was such a powerful moment in him. He says, you, you got to understand, we beheld his glory, all right? But we have something even better. We've got God's inspired and error word in front of us, right? So the, the idea here is he goes that you can share in the glory. You'll be able to see God in his glory. Uh, that's the goal of, of your faith. Then he's got a, a, a blessing and a command here in 15 and 16. So Paul goes on and says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So you can see there, hold on and seize, don't let go of this stuff, all right? And so to, to take God's word, to memorize it, and to use it in your life, and to encourage your kids and grandkids to do this, uh, that's how we can apply this to our life. Again, may God help you and strengthen you. You go into chapter 3, and Paul's going to talk about his ministry. 3 verse 1, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. So you can see on the outline there, obviously praying that the gospel would be going out and that they would be safe. And so read Acts and see all the things that Paul's go, Paul goes through. Or I gave you the uh, cross reference to 2 Corinthians 1. Paul uh, gets out his resume and says, I was shipwrecked, I was beaten, I was in prison. He just lists everything that went, he went through in sharing the gospel. And so again, there, was evil, there were evil men out there who wanted to stop it. And it was a satanic plot to, to uh, short circuit the gospel. And then you pick up in 3 verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you and keep you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you, will, you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts in God's, into God's love and Christ's perseverance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching we receive, you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the name of, in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Don't associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. On the outline there, the, the instruction about work. So evidently, because there was this misunderstanding about the Lord's return, wow, we missed the Lord's return, or he's coming, and so let's not work anymore, let's just kind of hang around. Well, after a while, you should you're going to have to eat, well, you don't have any more food, and he hasn't shown up yet, so now they're glomming off other people and, and taking stuff, and he goes, look, these people are idle. They need to get to work, all right? Following the Lord's command, all right? And so he goes, I want you to remember the Lord's command uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ back in, in verse uh, 6 there. The cultural commission, what some people call the cultural commission, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue. Okay, what all people are quote unquote programmed to do, we, we, we are designed to work, work is good, and then again to, to have children, have families and the like, right? And then he says, imitate me, we set you an example. 
right? So we lived among you, and we could have just taken stuff, but we didn't. And I gave you cross reference to Acts 18, you can read it. Paul says, I, I hung out with tent makers because that's what my trade was. I knew how to make tents. And so I'd work during the day, and then I'd preach uh, gospel later. And so the idea of Paul working, that's what he's referring to, him uh, working and, and making tents. And then the idea of supporting yourself. Man's not going to work, he's not going to eat. But then also being able to help others. And so Ephesians 4 talks about um, you should work and then be able to share with those in need. So again, we, we extend the love of God in people's lives by sharing what we can. As Paul wraps up his letter, he closes like this in verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. So I love that. God's peace, uh, tranquility. Uh, it, Paul's letters, grace and peace, this quietness. You know who's on the throne. You know he knows your name. Every hair on your head is numbered, right? He, no one's going to snatch you out of his hand. So all that quietness that, that calms us down in the midst of strife is there for you. Verse, Paul, uh, verse 17, Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. I think I've shared this with you before. My belief is his thorn in the flesh is bad eyesight, right? So I gave you the cross-references. Acts 9, he's blinded on the road to Damascus. 2 Corinthians 12, he wants the thorn in the flesh to be taken away three times. He prays, the Lord says no. And then in Galatians 4, Paul says, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me if you could have, right? See with which large letters I'm writing to you. So those are references, I think, that refer to something maybe with his vision he had trouble with. So we always had to depend on the Lord. But either way, he goes, this is the way I write. So he's signing off on this letter. Because remember, he's got um, um, Silas helping him with this. And then finally, he says, the grace of our, our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right, Jesus, undeserved mercy to you. If you flip the sheet over and go to the back side, let's take a, a one-minute stretch break here, rain break. Take a one-minute stretch break. And then we'll take a look at Trinity versus anti-Trinity. All right, so let's take a one-minute break. And we're back in five, four, three, two, one. Backside of the sheet, we're taking a look at Trinity and anti-Trinity. So the concept of the Trinity, you can see in Scripture, but you won't find the word. All right, so if you get a concordance and look at the word Trinity, you're not going to find the word Trinity in the Bible. But you find the concept in the Bible, all right? Three in one triune, one God, three persons. So different ways we illustrate it in the Christian church, we use a triangle, we use... Uh, three uh, petals of a clover leaf, um, water as, as solid liquid and gas, aquafresh toothpaste. I shared that illustration with you before. No, I haven't done this one with you. I've done aquafresh, right? So sometimes I'll, I'll say, kids, yeah, Trinity's like aquafresh. And then, whoa, whoa. One toothpaste, three colors, three flavors. Uh, uh, I'll be here all week, thanks. And um, so again, I, I can't understand it. We accept it by faith. Some people use the illustration of a watch where you can look at your watch and push a button and it gives you the time, and then you push the button on the watch and then it gives you your heart rate, and then you push the button and it's a timer, and it's like, yeah, but it's not modes, and that's a different discussion for another time. Modalism, the idea that God appears in different modes. It's like, no, these are three distinct persons. They're not just 
appearing in one way, and then God appears in another way, and then God appears in another way. No, these are three distinct persons, and we just go, we just believe it, right? Second bullet point, in the Old Testament, again, not going to find the word Trinity, but you'll find references to these three. So in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the Spirit was over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And you know, in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and Everything that was created was through Jesus, the Word, right? So there's the three. Uh, I gave you Genesis 22, um, and you can look at that sometime, with Abram and his sacrifice. The angel of the Lord, it says, speaks to Abram and says, you know, don't kill Isaac. You have not, uh, you have not withheld your son from me. And it's odd that the angel of the Lord is saying, you haven't held, withheld your son from me. And so there's the theologians who go, when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, not just any angel, but angel of the Lord, is this the second person of the Trinity before Jesus took human flesh. Right? It's a fascinating thing to look at, right? And then you find references to triples in the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Right? And so, in the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron, number six, I give you that. Uh, or Isaiah six, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so what you'll see in Scripture, Old and New Testament, or in, especially like in Revelation, triples are associated with God. Right? So again, it's kind of cool to look at, something you can check out. In the New Testament, again, you're not going to find the word Trinity, but you'll see things where the triune God is there. The baptism of Jesus is, is most clear. God the Father audibly speaks, Jesus is being baptized, and then the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. So three of them right there, right? Um, and the Great Commission, go out and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Uh, in, in 1 John, the idea that Jesus is our defense, and the Holy Spirit is a legal counsel, and God the Father is the judge, the prosecutor is the devil, right? This kind of courtroom setting is kind of interesting. So, on this uh, board here, um, when I'm teaching, I like to use the triangle for the Trinity, and so it's easy to draw, and then you've got one shape with three sides, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So, one God, three persons, right? But now let's talk about the anti-Trinity. When you go to the elevator, you can go up, or you can go down, right? And so, you can be pushing that button, or you can be pushing that button, right? There's only two teams. Jesus says, you're either with me or against me. Either gather with me or scatter. And so what's fascinating in Scripture is there seems to be an anti-trinity on the outline. What are they? They're not triune in the sense of one God, three persons. It's two demonic spirits, the devil and a, and a demon, and then a man. So we saw this, the Antichrist back in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, I gave you the Ephesians 6, 12 passage. Paul goes, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There are demonic forces at work. And so Old and New Testament, you see this. But let's start with the devil. Devil means accuser or adversary. All right? Let's go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. The origin of the devil is a fascinating thing to consider. And so in Genesis, you see the six days of creation, the day of rest, and then all of a sudden Satan appears and he's tempting Adam and Eve. Well, a logical question is, well, what happened? How did he fall? Did God make him evil? And the answer to that is no, God did not make the devil evil, um, this fallen angel, right from the jump. It sounds like the devil um, rebelled against God and, and fell, if you will, uh, in his satanic rebellion, and other demons went with him. So we're going to Ezekiel 28, 12, 14. Isaiah 14 is another section we could look at, but we're just going to look at this one in Ezekiel 28, uh, 12 to, to, to 20. The, the context is this. Ezekiel is, has a prophecy for an earthly king, and, and yet this king can't be the subject of the, the prophecy. It has to be talking about something else, because no human being matches uh, what this is. So it seems to be talking to something more than just an earthly king. 
Uh, Ezekiel 28, 12. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day that they were created, or you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and I consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground, and in the sight of all who are watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You've come to a horrible end and will be no more. And so this king may be being compared to the devil. If you take a look at the outline there, what do you know from this text? He's a, an angel, a cherub. He was created. He was perfect, and then he was prideful, and that was his sin, his rebellion. Colossians 1.16, By him, Jesus, all things were made, whether in heaven or on earth, whether visible or invisible. All things were created for him and by him. And so Jesus created all things. And so, as, as he speaks all things into existence, the angels are created, and scholars go, it's probably sometime in the six days of creation, but we're never told, was it day two, was it day four, was it day six? We don't know. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. It's just that God makes this creation, and remember, after day six, he's done, and it's very good. There, there's nothing wrong. So God did not make Satan with sin, flawed, evil, the analogy what I use in class is this. What Satan did was no one tempted him. He just looked at himself and said, why am I taking orders? I want to be giving orders. And that's why when you read Isaiah 14, it says five times, I will. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. The last one is, I'm going to make myself like the most high. And then he's fallen. He, he is cast down. And so here's the, the first part of this anti-trinity. So on the bottom triangle, Satan opposite the Father, and in Revelation is pictured as a dragon, right? And so in Revelation 12 through 22, second half of the book, the anti-trinity is there, and you see the dragon. And then it tells you clearly in Revelation 12, 9, the devil is the dragon. So you don't have to interpret the Revelation imagery, you're just told that's what it is. Now, Antichrist, what we just looked at from 2 Thessalonians. So that's just summarized again for you from the front side of the outline. Now go to 1 John 2. Go to 1 John 2. The word Antichrist comes from John's letter, 1 John 2. Paul said, man of lawlessness. And so when you read John's first epistle or first letter, uh, he's, he's dealing with Gnostic false teachers. Gnosticism was a belief that anything comprised of matter is inferior to the spiritual world. And God wants to get you out of this physical world to the spiritual realm. All right? And there were all sorts of false teachings then. Is that a ramification for, did Jesus really have a body if everything comprised of matter is evil? And so some Gnostic teachers were teaching Jesus didn't have a body. He just looked like he had a body. He really didn't have a body because he couldn't have one, right? And so that's so why when you read John's letter, why does John talk the way he does? Well, he's dealing with Gnostic heresy. And so these false teachers were pointing to what their knowledge was. You need what we have. You don't need Jesus. You need what we have. And so you let us teach you about what's true and what's real. And then you'll be saved because knowledge will save you. Gnosis in Greek is knowledge. So these Gnostics were emphasizing knowledge. You know what we know. And you'll be saying, it's not Jesus, it's knowledge it saves. And so that's the context of this letter when you read 1 John. So you're in verse uh, 18 in 1 John 2. 
And John writes this, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've, as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they're going to show that none of them belong to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who's the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. It's a great section. Again, understand the context. False teachers, Gnostics, saying, you don't need Jesus, you need our knowledge. We're going to give you the information that you've got to have to be saved, right? Go back to 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so even now many Antichrists have come. So capital A, Antichrist is coming, what we just read in 1 John, or 2 Thessalonians 2. But he goes, there are many people who are Antichrist. What are they? He goes, anyone who says that Jesus, verse 22, is, uh, denies that Jesus is the Messiah is the Antichrist. So these are types of Antichrist, many Antichrist. I use the example small a Antichrist. But the capital A Antichrist is coming, what we just saw in 2 Thessalonians, a man claiming to be God, setting himself up in a physical temple or the church, doing demonically inspired miracles, deceiving people, and destroyed by the Lord. In Revelation chapter 13, he is a beast from the earth, all right? So he is just a man in these uh, beautiful, not beautiful, but powerful imagery. He looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. It's such good imagery, it's so powerful. So he, he, he looks Christ-like, but he speaks like a dragon, right? Uh, one of the national youth gatherings years ago has a powerful demonstration of this, and I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you guys about it. There were two guys on stage at one of the mass events. At the mass events, you'll be in a, in a large stadium, kind of like Amphan Field, and, and, and tens of thousands of kids. And um, this guy comes out, he's dressed in a beard, long hair, white robe, and it's Jesus, right? And so he looks exactly like Jesus. And so everybody starts to applaud because at the Mass of Meadow, here's Jesus at our National Youth Gathering. How cool is this, right? And so as he begins to talk, there's a biblical message, and yet it's slightly askew. It's, it's not exactly accurate. And so you're seeing a guy who looks like Jesus, but the message is not on target. It's not biblical. And then, they must have gotten twins to do this. Another guy shows up on stage, exactly the same look. Beard, long hair, white robe. And he starts to speak the truth, the biblical truth, and drives that false Christ off the stage. And so it was so powerful, but it was a great depiction of he looked like a lamb. Jesus is the lamb in Revelation, but he spoke like a dragon, right? The message didn't fit. And that's why, again, in Scripture we're always told, test everything. Hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. First Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Last thing is the spirit of the Antichrist. Go to 1 John 4. So just turn a couple chapters over. Go to 1 John 4. Uh, a strange uh, passage in 1 John is John saying the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. So in 1 John 4, look at verse 1. John writes, Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So when John writes this, it's, it's decades after Jesus has ascended. John is the only apostle who lives and doesn't die a martyr's death. And so as he's ministering he, into his old age, he says, you've got to understand, you're going to hear all sorts of stuff. You always test it, and you test it with the Word of God. Is what you're hearing consistent? If it's not, 
then you know it's not of God. And then he focuses on this. Look at verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. The Gnostics were saying, you know, anything comprised of matter is, is evil, is, is inferior. So Jesus couldn't have had a body. He just looked like he had a body. Well, then you go, well, then what did they nail to the cross? They nailed something to the cross. It wasn't a ghost. And so that's why John goes, look, you, you've got to acknowledge Jesus has come in the flesh. He's God, man. He was baptized, he bled, he breathed on us when he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, right? Verse 3, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. You don't need Jesus, you need knowledge. You need our secret knowledge that we're going to teach you in our little club, right? He goes, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. It's not the Antichrist. He goes, it's the spirit of the Antichrist which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Paul goes, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so, opposite the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, he's a beast, but he's coming out of the sea. And so, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the Holy Christian Church on earth and keeps it in the one true faith. God, the Holy Spirit, creates faith. This demonic spirit is doing just the opposite. You don't need Jesus. You're good. Or you can worship this, or you can worship that, right? And so, this anti-Trinity seem to be just playing off what the real trinity is. Two demonic spirits, fallen angels, if you will, and a human male. This is, again, my opinion. Just my opinion. My opinion. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus goes, you shall have no other gods. This is just my opinion. I believe this man will take the satanic deception you worship me, and I'll give you the world. That's my opinion. And so, on the outline there, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. It will not acknowledge Jesus as Savior. Paul says in Ephesians 2, I give you the cross-reference, there is a spirit at work in those who are disobedient. Huh. Or, 2 Thessalonians 2, we looked at it, there is this secret power of lawlessness that's already at work. So that's why I put question marks on that. Is that, what, is that the spirit of the Antichrist? The spirit at work in those who are disobedient? Am I saying everyone who's not a Christian is possessed? No, I'm not saying that. Right? Demonic possession is a different issue. What I'm saying is there are spiritual forces at work. When you read Old Testament, God the Holy, or God the Holy Spirit's at work, and Michael is the angel for Israel, and then there's Satan. And so you see those angels clashing, a fallen angel, the devil, and Michael, Old Testament, but you also see that in Revelation as well. And so there are forces at work besides the earthly kingdoms and rulers that are out there. And that's what uh, a biblical worldview does. It helps us understand what's the natural and the supernatural realities that are around us. And so with this, we get an understanding of what's going on. Uh, there are people who, again, are following God. There are people who are not. Right? Again, you can push either button, but you only have two choices, right? You're either saved or unsaved. You're either on God's team or not. We are over time. Let's throw open the questions. If you got any questions, thoughts, comments as we close out 2 Thessalonians. What's next? <laughs> what's next? <laughs> we will see. You got to talk to pastors. What's next? Clear as mud. <laughs> there you go, clear as mud. All right, well, very good. So stay tuned. We'll see what's next, all right? Um, but boy, this Tuesday throws us off, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know, all right? <laughs> Two for Tuesday next time. So, all right, so let's pray, and then we'll end. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the message you give us and the comfort that it provides, that we know the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But Lord, we also understand there are forces at work. Lord, I pray that we not be fearful that we would point people towards Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we pray for a good night's sleep. We look forward to uh, a day to serve you tomorrow. Bless the Lutheran Education Association convocation occurring in Milwaukee uh, over the next couple of days. Keep everyone safe as they travel in. And pray that you're lifted up and glorified in that uh, teacher convention. And uh, again, the people are, are blessed. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you. Thank you, Brad. Amen.